So it, recently I've been hearing um, a lot of growing talk about uh, people saying there's revival in the air. And, and when I ask them what that means, they say, well, I don't know, it just feels like people are becoming more spiritual and they're, they're looking for God. And, and I agree. I, I think that is, that's very much true. I think we're seeing a slow, very slow cultural shift towards people seeking something deeper in their lives. Now, I'm not just talking about church attendance, and we're seeing growth here at Cold Spring Methodist, and that's really good, but what I'm talking about is the broader non-Christian culture starting to look over at the wall and say, what's this other stuff all about? Does anyone else here feel like there's revival in the air? Just me. <laughs> Does anyone else feel like there's revival in the air? It's like, there we go. Okay, okay. Yeah, this, is, this is a give and take relationship here, okay? So who all here watched the show Chosen? Say, oh, you got the hand part down. Good, okay. Over 100 million people watched that series. That's astronomical. That's... Uh, a massive, and it's a, it's a show that was not produced by a major studio. It's one-third the population of the United States. A hundred million people worldwide have watched The Chosen. And other Christian films like the, the Jesus Revolution, it made waves at the box office. Hollywood is scratching their head going, what is going on? And we're seeing the same thing happen. The Christian music is thriving, and we have artists like Justin Bieber and, and um, uh, Jelly Roll and even Kanye West, and they're all starting to move spiritual lyrics into their songs because they're being moved by the Holy Spirit to do those things. And, and on social media, we're seeing buzz on, on Facebook and on Twitter, now X, and uh, TikTok, right? You see hashtags like uh, uh, the revival movement trending, so, and apparently now, it's cool to be a Christian. Where did that come from? Ten years ago, you remember the grief Tim Tebow caught for kneeling on the football field in prayer? But now it's okay for athletes to openly proclaim Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Beginning of the football season, some Ohio State football players all arrived at the the camp wearing shirts that said, Jesus won. Something's changing. Something's definitely in the air. But is it revival? Or is it curiosity? Who all remembers uh, hearing about the event at Ashbury Seminary last year? February last year, um, so it was a routine chapel service, and it turned into this continuous worship experience. And it lasted for over two weeks. Thousands of people came from all over the country to experience the spiritual movement that was happening at Asbury University. And you can't deny that it wasn't somehow real, because all the people that were there uh, they report feelings of peace. They reported healings. They reported um, a new commitment to their faith. Something was going on. Something was in the air. Was it a revival? Revival is from Latin, revivalis. And it means to live again. And so in spiritual terms, that means that you're bringing something back to life with a, with a new vigor. And this concept isn't new. Revivals have been part of the Christian movement since the very beginning. John Wesley was the pioneer of the outdoor revival movement. Starting in the 1700s all the way up to the, the Jesus movement of the 1960s, we've seen a revival and then another revival and a revival. If you look at the dates, you'll see that there's five or four significant moments they call the Great Awakening. And to be a Great Awakening or a revival, society had to have made profound changes. And if you look at the dates, you see it happens about every 60 years. There was one jump in there where it went from 1840, yeah, no, about every 50, 60 years, 
The last one was in the 1960s to the 70s. How many of you all remember the Jesus movement? You're in a little small town. It happened out in California. They even made a movie about it. It's called The Jesus Revolution. It's, it's a famous story about a bunch of hippies who went to a little small church like this, and they annoyed the heck out of the congregation that was there, but the pastor says, that's what love looks like, and he invited them to stay. And the movement grew, and it grew, and it grew, and tens of thousands of people came to Christ, and it transformed the Christian movement in the country. It gave it another boost of energy, and we saw that whole Christian movement keep going and going and going well into the 80s. That was a revival. That was a great awakening. And it's been 60 years since the last big revival. Let me ask the question, are we due for the fifth great awakening? Something's in the air. But to be a true revival, it has to be very similar to the very first Christian revival. Does anyone know when the very first Christian revival was? We read about it in Scripture today. After the day of the Pentecost, Scripture in Acts 2, verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. It's starting to sound like how people were feeling at Asbury last year. All the believers were together and they held everything in common. Sounds like the people in Asbury last year. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone in need. I didn't hear about that part. But every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their number daily, those who were saved that's what the first revival looked like. That was the first great awakening. And those people weren't just attending a revival. They weren't attending church. They invented the church. They were living out their faith in this brand new radical way, kind of like how people mocked the people in the 60s for these hippies and the, living out their, their new faith. It says they shared everything, they prayed together. The first revival didn't just change individual lives, it changed the world. The early church, it grew exponentially. It impacted city after city. It, it, it changed entire cultures. It brought down a Roman Empire. That's a revival. Is anyone interested in living in a community like this? Share everything, break bread together all the time. If you're a little skeptical, I, you might want to reconsider. I'm pretty sure that's what heaven's going to look like. Revelation 7, 9 to 10, every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. It sounds like it's one giant communion of love for Christ. That's a revival. So back to my early question, are we, are we due for a fifth great awakening? The buzz is in the air. I think to know that, we have to know what sparked the first revival. 49 days after Christ was crucified, began the Festival of Weeks in Jerusalem. We know it better as Pentecost, which means the 50th. So on the 50th day, the celebration started in Jerusalem, and the, and the city was packed with people. But about a week or so before, maybe 10 days before, the disciples were all gathered with Jesus as he was getting ready to ascend. And he said to them, 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus lifted off and went up behind the clouds, and they're all standing there with their mouths open going, wow, what happened? What, what was that? And I don't know, if I was one of them, you couldn't have got me to Jerusalem fast enough. Because I was going to receive a power and the Holy Spirit. What, what are you even talking about? What is this? And they all did what Jesus said. They all went to Jerusalem and they were in a large room. And they know something's going to happen, but they, but they don't know what. There's a buzz in the air. The scripture says, when suddenly the sound of a mighty rushing wind filled the house and tongues of fire descended upon the disciples. And they began to speak in, in various languages. And all the crowds outside the doors and windows were hearing the commotion. They're wondering, what is going on? How many of you all ever been to a shopping mall? Let's make it Christmas time. And you notice there's a, there's a buzz in the air. There's a, whole, there's a crowd assembly like in the main area. And you're, like, and you're kind of like, what's going on? And you're like, I, I need to see what's going on. I'm lazy. I climb upstairs and I look down. But that's what was happening in Jerusalem on Pentecost. The people outside, they're going, what's going on? What's, that's something about fire and flames and people speaking other languages. What's going on? Let me ask you a question. What would you have done had you been there? If you'd been outside those doors or walking down the street and like in the mall you see uh, the crowds gathering are you indifferent eh, it's those Jesus people or are you skeptical oh, he was not the Messiah or would you be curious would you wonder what in the world is, is really going on What about right now? There's a buzz in the air. Are you indifferent? Are you curious? Are you just skeptical? If we're in the fifth, if we're in the, the onset of this fifth great awakening, what are you thinking about? Or have you even heard about it? If I asked you, where would you fit in this moment? Where are you? And you're going, I don't even know what you're talking about. I haven't heard about no fifth of, no, no buzz in the air. Revival? Who, what are you talking about, pastor? You know, when I was working on this sermon, I discovered that our present day society makes me wonder if a fifth awakening could even happen. I'm starting to doubt we would ever see a revival. The reason is there's something vastly different in our world today than we've ever seen before. Sadly, I propose that as a culture, as a global society, we're too distracted to have a great awakening. You know, earlier I mentioned the revival in Kentucky and how it went on for two weeks and everyone was excited. Oh, the, the revival's starting. The awakening is coming. Here it comes. And then it fizzled out. Half of you didn't even hear about it. You know, the school officials, they're actually downplaying it. They were calling it the Ashbury Revival. They've changed the name to, it was the Ashbury Outpouring. School officials aren't even hanging the word revival on it anymore because it fizzled out. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. There was too many people in this world too distracted by the things of the world to even notice the buzz coming from Kentucky. 
the buzz coming from those college football fields where people are being baptized, A&M baptized how many thousands of students just last week. People are just too distracted to even know those things are going on. How can we have a great awakening if no one wants to be awoken? Is that a word? Awoken? Put that in the Oxford English Dictionary. It is now. <laughs> You know, you may find this hard to believe, but I think quite honestly, quite frankly, too many people in this world right now just don't care if there's a great awakening. They don't care if there's a revival because they got too many other things to do. Paul Harvey, in his 1965 speech, he said, if I were the devil... I'd encourage people to be concerned about the here and now and the present and not about the hereafter. I think the prophecy of Paul Harvey is exactly why we may not see the fifth coming. Satan has done a masterful job of distracting us from the hereafter. But what are we being distracted by that is so powerful we just want to not even notice when God's tapping on our shoulder Let's start with technology. We're being bombarded by rapid changes in technology and the way that we are supposed to be accommodating our lives to these mechanical devices and to the, the, the websites and the, the social media sites and, and, the, and the telephones. That we've lost track of the truths, the timeless truths of Scripture. Instead of turning to God, we just endlessly scroll through that social media. And we're losing meaningful connections with our own families, let alone God. You've all seen it. Maybe you do it. Who's guilty of sitting at the dinner table while everyone's out on their phone? I am. And Becky and I, we catch ourselves and we go, oh. Another major distraction is the polarization of politics. Is it just me or does it seem like every election year gets uglier and more divisive than the last? Can we all agree that our culture is mired in division and it's pulling away from our shared values and our spiritual growth? Can we all at least agree on that? That we're broken? That this promise of one nation under God ain't so much anymore? See, we, we need to have a deep longing and a more profound relationship to God, one that's actually of a little more priority to us than a cell phone. But the reality is, who has time to work on repentance when there's so much other distractions that keep us from the Sundays? No, I don't think we're ready for a fifth awakening. Even though this world is in terrible need of a revival. We need to live again under one sovereign Lord, not the World Economic Foundation or the United Nations. What an oxymoron. We're one nation under God, indivisible, or we used to be. We're awful divided now. You know where we are right now? We're exactly back to what I call day one. We're at the day after Jesus got baptized. Remember John the Baptist come out, clear the path, make way the path for the Lord. And when Jesus had to be baptized, Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And, and he went to Galilee and he declared this to all the world. But only a few were curious. The rest were skeptical or indifferent. The only way a fifth awakening is going to be happen 
It's when enough people are no longer distracted by the evil influences of the world. Awakening it can't come until we acknowledge our, our personal and our corporate sins and we turn away from anything that moves us from God. Man, is that hard. It, it requires us to have an attitude of, of humility and a willingness to submit to God. How do you submit to God? You seek Him in prayer. And you pray not only for your personal needs, you pray not only for your family, you pray not only for this town of Cold Spring, but you pray for the nation and you pray for the world. How many of you include prayers for the world? We get so caught up in our own little thing, but we're to pray for all of it. Jesus isn't the king of the United States. He's the king of the world, and we pray for healing of the whole world. See, the reality is revival can only come from the Holy Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit? It's in the same place it was on the day of the Pentecost. It's right here. And it's because of the Holy Spirit. You have this yearning for revival. You have this yearning for a great awakening. You have this yearning for people to come together and to be peace and joy and happiness and love. And everyone shares everything. But we all know that's bunk because we can't even do it in our own family. And we struggle. But we keep hoping someone else will start a fifth awakening. We keep hoping that that Ashbury thing would have caught fire, you know, and if, next thing you know, it's all Kentucky, and then it starts in the Mississippi, and it works its way down to Louisiana, and, and what do you know, there's revival in Cold Spring. That's not how it works. Revival begins right here in your heart. There's only one place where revival can start, it's right here. Deep down, we know through our Holy Spirit that when we live in the presence of God, it brings conviction, it brings transformation, it brings empowerment. You would think that's what all of us would want to have. And I think we do. I don't think we're indifferent. I don't think we're skeptical. I think we're curious. But we're distracted. And as long as we remain distracted, there's not going to be a great awakening. The world's just going to keep going like it is and getting worse. Paul warns us about living in the world. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How do we do this? How do you not conform to the patterns of the world? You change your world. You're transformed by the renewing of your own mind. You change how you think about the culture. You've got to take proactive steps to get out of the distractions. There's things you can do. Create a space for God, for Lord's sake. Take out time every day just to be alone with God. Maybe try to find a way to do a digital detox. Set an alarm on your phone at 7.30 at night, you turn that thing off. Or maybe you don't check Facebook first thing before your feet hit the ground. I'm guilty. First thing I do when I wake up is I see what's going on in the world. I'm not even out of bed yet. And I'm getting anxious. I'm getting distracted. Honestly, the reason I do it, I wake up to see if there's some disaster as a pastor I need to be ready to handle. That's okay. See how I rationalize that? You're not all pastors. <laughs> Second thing you can do is join a small group. 
We've got some people here who've started small groups in the church. And, and Vicki, through the Christian Education Group, we're going to try to teach people how to do small groups. But if you want to be in a small group, and I encourage you all to be in a small group, and you can't find one, start one. Invite someone over. Invite two couples over and say, hey, let's, let's work through the book of Mark. Let's work through this one devotional. Let's be intentional. You know what happens when you have two or three other couples that you've been meeting with regularly? Pretty soon you're not doing things that you shouldn't be doing because you know they might hear about it the next week. That's called accountability. It's in the Bible. But who wants to be accountable? We'd rather be distracted. Lastly, I just encourage you, engage in service. Michael talked about this with the, the pledge of giving, the giving cards. There's only one check mark, one thing there about dollars. Every single thing else in there is about your spiritual life. I pray, I pledge to pray. I pledge to volunteer. I pledge to uh, spend time in a devotional. I pledge to do this. That's what you're pledging. You're pledging to be a Christian. You're pledging to be intentional in your faith. You're pledging to get rid of the darkness of this world and bring it into your life through giving. Giving of yourself as a servant to Christ. And I think he deserves it. revival in the air? Yeah, I think there's a buzz in there. Do I think a revival is brewing? Maybe. Do I think most of the world is too distracted to miss the importance of God trying to come alongside them? Yes, I do. So here we are. We're standing at this crossroads of, of faith and culture which one's broader? Culture. Which one's narrow? Your faith. And here you are, you're standing at these crossroads, you have to ask yourselves, are you ready for the fifth great awakening? Are you ready to, to remove yourself from the distraction of the world so you can seek that transformative power? I couldn't have run fast enough to get Jerusalem to experience that. But now I have all these distractions. Yeah, they, that's for those people. I know for many of you, this is scary. For some of you, it just sounds inconvenient. I need my phone. I need to check my messages. But imagine what could happen if we all collectively embrace this moment. What if we all started making our house becoming places of prayer? What if we saw that our, our communities were truly a place of service? What if our hearts were open to the revival of the Holy Spirit? What if we weren't ready for or waiting for that buzz to appear? What if we became the buzz in the air? I remember last year, right about this story, coming up on Christmas, we were doing the Christmas Angels. And as I met one of the other ladies from the other churches, she met me for the first time. She goes, oh, you're that new pastor over at Cold Spring. I said, yes, I am. She goes, I heard you're on fire over there. This congregation was a buzz in the air, and it still is. You are still what people are talking about in this town. You're the ones that they're seeing more cars in the parking lot. You're the places where they're, they're seeing other things going on. You're the ones that are seeing that every week has a booth on the square. You're the ones that they see leading these drives. You're the ones that they see creating cantatas for the community to participate in. We're, we're creating a cantata so the whole community can witness. You're the people that they're watching collect coats. You're the ones that they're seeing stack up cans on the wall and giving them the care share. There is a buzz in the air right here. You are your own revival kindling. 
We don't have to wait for it to come from Kentucky. It can start right here. Let me close with something Jesus had to say when he finished his Sermon on the Mount and how he memorized that whole thing, I'll never know. If you watch the show Chosen, you get the joke, but never mind. So in Matthew 6, you get down around verse 30, 31, he's, he's talking about the difficulties of living in the world. He's talking about the fact that there's people chasing false idols, and, and because of their distractions in their lives, they're having trouble understanding his message. He's talking about the same thing I'm talking about today. And in verse 32, he says, For pagans run after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He's saying, I know you need your distractions. I know you need your time on the phone, but you need time for me first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. You can have all that if you put God first. You keep the buzz alive. You keep the people talking. You keep yourself engaged and recharged, vital. I didn't welcome the UMCOR back like I should have, but they, they came back from their mission this last week, and not a single one of them looks tired. They look energized. How many boxes did you guys put together? Four, almost 5,000 hygiene kits. And Joel got a 10-year pen. <laughs> and you know what? They weren't necessarily welcome there because they're global Methodist. But they showed them, didn't they? Because there's a buzz here in this church. There's a energy that's transcending our doors and going outside. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all things will be given to you. That sounds like an awful abundant life to me. Do you know what the word abundant life translates to? Eternal life. Eternal life. And it's all because God gave us his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly died on the cross so that our sins would be forgiven. And all we have to do is believe in him. And he gives you that promise of an abundant life, an eternal life with him. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your inspiration. We, we thank you for just pointing out that you're trying to get our attention and that there is a buzz in the air and it's you tapping on our shoulders and you're just trying to get us to wake up, Lord. You're trying to just tell us if we just set the evil that the world has created to one side that you have something to talk to us about, about how this little congregation... Each and every one of us can transform the world. And it's his holy name we pray. Amen.